Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Capital Gains Tax Solutions to Fertile Trust Mastermind, where we believe most high net worth individuals and those who help them, they struggle with clarifying their capital gains tax deferral options. Not having a clear plan is the enemy and using a proven tax deferral strategy such as the Deferred Sales Trust um, to help your clients and or yourself exit highly appreciated primary homes, businesses, cryptocurrency, defer hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars of tax is an amazing way to create and preserve more wealth. Um, as well to be thinking about something called tax flow versus cash flow. Now, most of us are taught just to, it's all about cash flow. It's all about cash flow. Well, it's more and more and more important about about uh, more and more these days about tax flow because taxes are going up and highly appreciated assets are ready to sell. And we're in a potentially very uh, transitionary market from a bull market to potentially a, a recession. We'll see what happens here or at least a shift. And so if you're going to exit something that you've built for many years, 10, 20, 30 years, and blood, sweat, and tears, and you've invested, and you've built, and you have this huge capital gains tax, somewhere between 25 and 50% of your gain, and that's including depreciation recapture, you want to have something that's going to help you uh, to defer that, to grow that. It's the same reason you might do a 1031 exchange. You might have an IRA or a 401k or do some cost segregation or do look at what's called opportunity zones. These are all tax incentives that encourage us to do what the government wants us to do, which is to invest into the economy economy to grow a uh, business and venture, which creates more jobs, which therefore creates more tax revenue. So the deferred sales trust is just one of those secrets that most people just don't know about. No, they have heard about it, but don't know how to do it. And so we're here to try to make it very simple and to answer your questions, to talk about a live deal of uh, the that we just closed, um, usually about one per week. And I'm not by myself. I am unfortunately am able to be joined by who I call the CPA Whisperer. He's a financial advisor. He's he's he served our country in the military. He's amazing. He's the one and only Jake Miller. Jake, how are we doing today? Doing very well, Brad. Happy to be here calling in from Mexico City and uh, just helping people do a lot of great things. So it's it, I'm glad that the internet's working here in this fabulous hotel and I'm able to join. You sound loud and clear and crisp, and I, I love that too. So Jake. Uh, I said the vision a little bit, but I think it's great to hear it from uh, your perspective. So, give us a little bit of take on on what you've what you what you what the vision is here, as well as kind of what we're seeing right now uh, with the economy. Absolutely. So, first and foremost, with the vision, when individuals have highly appreciated assets, meaning that they've been successful at something already, they've got a business, they purchased real estate, they were in crypto, uh, whatever it might be. If it's a highly appreciated asset, now is the right time to sell. Let's not let taxes be the obstacle that gets in the way. And so with the deferred sales trust, we can help people do that. And see, it's an efficiency strategy. We're deferring it down the road. We're putting control of timing back in your hands so that you can decide when to recognize that transaction as a taxable event. And you can strategize with other strategies to combine and not only defer it now, but possibly offset it completely later. This is some of the magic that Brett and I work, pe work with people to uh, accomplish. I call it magic. I mean, it's sometimes simple math. Sometimes it's just simple law. And fortunately enough, we have really brilliant CPAs, tax attorneys. Um, even we've been speaking with some legislators, it, all, all the above, just to make sure that we're always bringing the very best to our clients. Um, as far as the market, or as far as you know, kind of like an economic update, we've got a lot of exciting things going on. And when I say exciting, for some people, it's very detrimental. Individuals that have had their money in, um, let's say, what, what Fidelity calls the red zone or the red period. It, essentially, five years before retirement or five years right after they've retired, when it's most critical or most detrimental that there's a big shift in the market for their holdings. But for everybody else, this is a huge opportunity to be able to buy at discount and be able to dollar cost average in and for being able to um, take advantage of where certain doors are closing and others are open. Um, whenever there's a big change in the economy, the market, uh, what have you, there's opportunities for those people who lie in wait and who are prepared and ready. And again, with the deferred sales trust, that's what we help people do. They are no longer being controlled by arbitrary timeframes, but they have the power of timing back in their hands. And we do what I call opportunity investing in liquid assets until that true opportunity whether it's a piece of real estate, whether it's uh, another business venture, comes along and the timing can be right. They don't have to uh, work through arbitrary time restrictions like people do with 1031s and things of that nature. 
Amazing. Who does this work for? It works for anybody who has a highly appreciated primary home business, real estate, LLC, L, uh, C Corp, S Corp, uh, at least a million dollar net proceeds and a million dollar gain, right? So you need to have a big enough transaction to qualify. Why? Because you got to have a big enough pain to hire us to help to close the deals. Um, and we want to make sure that it's equitable. The fees are somewhere around one and a half percent to close it one time and about one and a half to two percent on a recurring basis. It just depends on how and where the funds are invested. And so we want to make sure that gain is big enough to uh, substitute uh, or, or justify a tax liability deferral. Again, about 25 to 50 percent of that gain is taxable. And so a couple deal stories to kind of give you um, an idea what that looks like. We had a deal that was in Palo Alto. It was an $8.3 million primary home. This is a luxury property right on University Avenue. Beautiful property. Uh, my client bought it for about $6 million, or he bought it for about five, put about a million into it. Had it for many years. All the kids have grown. They're out, out of the house. And he's in this huge house that's highly appreciated, up to $8.3 million. And he's going, man, I wish I could sell, but I'm going to hit this tax. And the tax was around about $800,000 for state, federal, for California. No Obamacare because it was a primary home. So he had this huge tax. And he also had a big debt. And the debt was about $6 million as well. So he's looking at this situation where after he sells and pays commissions and pays tax he's like it doesn't make any sense but i need to sell and i want to retire and i want to downsize and the agent wanted to sell the property for them and get the commission and on and on it goes well enter um, our team we were able to sit down with him really clarify his vision for his wealth which is really step one about looking at the deferred sales trust if you're trying if you're thinking about this for yourself like why is it that you're selling what's the motivation for what you're selling what does that enable you to do if you could sell what could the cash flow off of the trust or the next investment mean for you and your family how does it help in your overall mission goals and values for your financial plan and so that's really step one so he clarified that and part of that was hey i want to move out of california and he did this a couple of years ago before even the even the the i'd say the the mass exodus that's happening with a lot of californians so he did a little bit early he wanted to move to Nevada. Nevada. And so that was his vision closer to family. And so that's what he did. We sold, deferred all the tax, paid off all of his debt. Uh, the realtor is happy. They got paid. You know, escrow was happy. We're happy. Government's happy too, because guess what? He's getting payments from the trust and of which he's paying tax as he receives it, but he's still deferring the vast majority of the gain. And so it's a win-win for everybody. So it works for primary homes. We also did a Jake and I, a recent deal for a cryptocurrency deal. It was a, uh, a, a, a client of ours. She worked for a big tech company out of Silicon Valley. She had $50,000 of, of uh, basically investment in Bitcoin and went to 50 million. That's when Bitcoin was at 54,000 a coin, which kind of leads into what Jake was talking about, optimal timing. And that's part of the values that we practice here at Capital Gains Tax Solutions. And that has to do with where and how the funds can be invested. And we can do it slowly as it makes sense, right? Not having to force a 45-day window to identify 180 days to close. And so for her, she was able to exit 5 million at 54,000 a coin. As we know, Bitcoin has dropped below 20,000 a coin, right? So essentially, Jake, that if I do the math, right jake help me with this um at 54,000 a coin at five million at twenty thousand a coin would that be about one and a half is that is like a or would that be about two and a half uh yeah i guess it'd be a little bit a little bit more than 50 percent drop right because twenty five thousand would be 50 so it'd be about 60 percent drop so essentially we defer help her defer about two million of tax not only that her vision was to start a company she's very entrepreneurial and she wanted to start um uh, a company, a tech company with her college roommate. And so the deferred sales trust is more than just a financial instrument. It's a transformational way to do the next business venture. So Jake, any thoughts on that? No, I mean, again, had she had to pay the tax, had she had to be subject to arbitrary timeframes, it wouldn't have been a deal anymore. It wouldn't have worked the way that it did. And so truly the deferred sales trust is just a financial tool that puts a little bit of the power back in the hands of the client of when to recognize taxes. It allows for the immediate deferral. And then of course you can take the funds as you need in the future to reinvest in other assets. Uh, right now with a lot of things changing in the economy, it's an appropriate time for some, not for everybody, but for some to adjust their asset lineup, to re-diversify. Maybe they have the cash cow business or the one thing that made them a lot of money and they need to kind of spread that out for risk purposes, as well as 
uh, making sure that they're accomplishing income goals, appreciation goals, legacy goals, asset protection, and all the above. The Deferred Sales Trust has been very instrumental in helping us with a lot of our clients as a keystone financial tool amongst other strategies. Fantastic. And some people ask, you know, Jake, it seems like it's too good to be true. You know, I mean, I feel like my my CPA would have heard about it. You know, I saw this this notice that was sent out from the California Franchise Tax Board that said, hey, you know, qualified intermediaries, make sure you're withholding. And, and then there's these blog posts from these really you know smart bloggers that are making these really strong you know, statements about, oh, is it legal? How do we know it's legal? All these different things. So, so Jake, when, you know, being that you, you had a chance to study and work with, you know, thousands of, of CPAs across the country and, and actually analyze and look at these strat different strategies over all of the years, which I believe that is the story itself, right? You actually found the Deferred Sales Trust while doing research to, to vet out some of the best of the best for these CPAs and working with them. And so talk about your kind of your journey to, to feeling rock solid, that it's legal, that it works, and that it's def defendable should an IRS come knocking on the door. Very good. I think first and foremost, I'll tell my story just real fast. Um, I was working with a very large national CPA firm coaching association of which I was assigned to the top 400 members of this 10,000 member group. Um, very, very powerful, very uh, important organization that was helping individuals, CPA firm owners, take their company to the next level and learn how to appropriately offer some of these best practice services to their clients. And I essentially was kind of like their back office. Uh, every Tuesday for two hours, they could ask us questions. They could um, fire them away, so to speak. And I had to have a pretty good answer and not just an answer, but substance behind the answer. I had to have source documents and proof, which for some things was easy because I had that for a lot of things. For other things, this became a very critical experience in my life, Brett, where I truly had to be fed by the fire hose and I had to go get the right information. And of course, it, I had to make sure that it was the right information because there's these CPA firm owners that sometimes have their own attorneys on staff and everybody else. And they're going to review with a fine tooth comb everything that I put before them, right? And they're looking to me as the subject matter expert, whether I know it or not in the moment, I had to find it out. In my research, out of these 423 strategies that we reviewed, um, I came across the Deferred Sales Trust. It wasn't something I was looking into at the time. But because I was looking at certain things with court cases and when it worked and when it didn't, because a lot of strategies, Brad, that's how it is. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Very few, if ever, if any strategies out there have a 100% track record with the IRS because inevitably people try to change things to suit their scenario in a way that's considered abusive or wrong. However, in what I was able to find, Brad, um, there's always naysayers, there's always uh, fake news people out there um, from everything that is legit. And we use tax research software to help us find information more quickly. Um, from every source that is legit, the Deferred Sales Trust has a 100% track record and it is a stellar strategy. It is one out of only two of the 423 strategies that we reviewed and provide as best practices how to implement for our team of CPAs, so to speak. And that's kind of a wonderful thing. That's why sometimes I call it magic. Not because there's anything magical about the process, but it's the fact that the strategy itself has not been abused by clients or people out there trying to change it to do something that it's not supposed to. But it actually has every single time. And it's been reviewed. Oh, I want to say it's had a official IRS review 12 times, which sometimes just requires information, documents, and an explanation. And it's had 11 actual full audits. Well, I say audits, partial or full audits. And uh, one of those, Brett, was actually in California. Maybe you can talk to that one a little bit. The sky rise, um, if, you, if you want to maybe touch on that. It, we want people to know out that out there of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of trusts, the IRS, it's almost like just pulling a name out of a hat. Every One out of every 2,000 people, maybe you might get audited. But when you have a deal size over $120 million, it's, it's more or less, it doesn't matter what strategy you're using. It's going to be one out of every two deal sizes, more or less, that are going to be audited or reviewed by the IRS. Can, can, can you touch on that one a little bit? Brad? Absolutely, Jake. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's such great background and it's such great um, um, uh, detailed uh, overview of the Deferred Sales Trust and, and, and your due diligence on it. Um, so yes, uh, there was the largest audit in the history of the Deferred Sales Trust was for a property in Southern California. It was a huge sky rise commercial real estate property. 
and uh, they did a audit and it's in the state of California, right? And it was no change, no findings, no change, no findings, which is really, really remarkable. Like for example, if anyone on this call, if we were to get an audit right now, there might be a receipt that we have missing for an expense. We might have, you know, have an accounting error. We might have done something where there could be a change on that. We might owe a little bit back or perhaps we, we get some a little bit back to us. Just There's going to be changes, but the actual transactions and there's been over a dozen no change irs individual audits for cases that were no trigger audits weren't triggered by the deferred sales trust but the deal sizes and the client transactions do at times like this one created uh, an opportunity of course for the irs to take a look at it. and there's nothing to hide there we showed it no change no problems now there's also been additional formal audits okay formal audits third party um CPA, large CPA firms, tens of thousands of tax returns, um, third party. Jake and I just had a deal where a client said, hey, you guys all sound really, this sounds amazing, but everyone who's saying it is on the inside, let me go find someone on the outside. Right? Find whoever you like. And he found independently from us, had never heard of it, a former uh, IRS uh, attorney um, or, or agent who became a tax attorney who actually writes what's called opinion letters for individual clients on certain strategies to help provide some insight and some protection, right? So this gentleman, he lives in, he actually is in California, Southern California as well. And uh, he did a three month due diligence, signed the NDA, went through it all, and guess what? Gave him the green light. This is as of about 30 days ago after his extensive due diligence. And so we can provide that person's name so you can talk to him. So all that being said, our goal with that is to try to help people overcome the false belief of this sounds too good to be true. I can't believe I haven't heard about it from my CPA. And then they look online and they get it confused with other strategies that have been not great in the IRS courts or are currently getting blown up or on the dirty dozen. And sometimes um, 1031 bloggers want to want to put everything together because guess what? A lot of 1031 exchange companies don't want you to know about this. Now, there are those that work with us and that are great, but a lot of them don't want that competition right but we literally have a perfect track record thousands of closes billions under management over a dozen uh, no change individual audits additional formal audits uh, third party you know CPAs it's really it's really extensive so it, it's literally batting a thousand and so we want to um, we want to give people the confidence that by the way this has recently come up quite a bit and it's about every single deal people will Google and then they'll see something and then they're like, get scared. And we're like, don't get scared. Look at the evidence and then let's come everyone in the room and let's break it down. By the way, how does this whole thing work? Well, let's break that down. Jake, how does this actually even work? And what are some of the timings for this thing to be executed? Absolutely. So we like to be in on the deal. Let's say that it's a real estate deal, for example, maybe 60 to 90 days before close. That's what we like. However, um, we have some people here on the call today. We help them a to Z, nuts the bolts, everything done in six days. Again, from an IRS perspective, we like to see that there's intent, or when I say we like to, we like to show that there's proper intent to use a business trust like this. And it's nice to have things early on when there's first a letter of intent, that from the very beginning, we're using the name of the trust, or we're talking about having it be a trust, things of that nature, all of that. Um, timing per deal can be a little bit different. What's really important is that we get in before all conditions are released. Should someone be able to go and knock on the door and say, hey, you, you have to transact the, 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 the <clears throat> you, you have to process the transaction now, exchange the property for what's being sold, et cetera, and there's nothing that can be done to stop it, then we're too late. And Brett, I, you have no idea how many times people ask me, hey, can we do this retroactive? Brett, why can we not do this retroactive? Well, A, number one reason is because it's, it, the, the IRS does not allow um, tax deferral for monies that we've received into our personal account. So in, the best example for people that mo most know a 1031 exchange, you need to send up the 1031 exchange prior to the close of escrow, right? So that the funds go to a qualified intermediary and not to your personal account. It, it would be an accounting nightmare for the IRS alone to allow people to do stuff that's retroactive. Now, there are certain strategies where you can, like an opportunity zone, you have about 180 days, even if it gone to your personal account, to put the money into an opportunity zone fund. Um, but certain strategies, for example, um, the 1031 exchange, or or even uh, even like you know IRAs, the money that comes out. There's certain they do some. They give you more flexibility with certain strategies, but. IRC 453, I guess to make a simple answer, is an installment sale, by the way. What you're doing is you're loaning the funds to the trust in exchange for the trust to pay you back over time. You're giving up 
ownership. You're selling it to the trust, and the trust is is now uh, the borrower to um, um, from from you, and it owes you the money back. So let's give you a deal. Actually, it just closed this week. Is in in, in Texas. Um, it was actually two properties, uh, and the the individual. Um, let me do another one. That one just closed yesterday, and I want to make sure I get the numbers right. So I'm gonna report that one next week. But we did one, another one in Texas about a month and a half ago. That one closed for 15.6 million. They they bought it at 11, and then they they did it basically a quick assignment to the trust, and they deferred about 4.6 million dollars of, of of gain. And so we set everything up so that the assignment of of the interest for the owner was assigned to the trust. So for the trust actually taking ownership and then sells it to the ultimate buyer and the the seller ends up with the promissory note. And so that's really the, the essence of it. It's a seller carry back and, and that what creates the tax deferral is essentially you can't pay tax on what you haven't received, right? If you haven't received any cash, there's nothing to pay tax on. Part of why the government, uh, we believe, set this up back in like the 1920s, this goes back a long time ago, uh, or these installment sale structures, because some of the banks really seized up during during the Great Depression, right? And as a part of that, they were looking at, well, the, the government can't be the bank for everything, right? And if we don't give people an opportunity to finance a new a new purchaser, they're not likely to transact because the tax is so big, but if we can incentivize them to not only sell, but then defer the tax, but if, as long as they put it into other investment properties or other investment vehicles that spurs economic growth, it's actually a win-win for everybody. So Jake, does that answer the question? It does. And, and you know, I think it's important that individuals understand the importance of timing and planning. We, we talk a lot in other channels, so to speak, about just overall tax planning or wealth management or financial planning or strategies in general. And here with the deferred sales trust, it's no different. A, an, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. What does that really mean? I mean, literally, if we can get the trust conversation going in the very beginning, we can get it in the process so that it's at least an option, an option that you don't have to choose, but you got to take a few steps to get it in place so that it can be that option. Then literally, this can be one of your keystone financial tools moving forward for a lot of different transactions. However, Again, should you not use this, then people have to start looking at pounds of cure. It's like, wow, I've got a really big taxable situation. You know, we've talked to some estate planning attorneys that try to look at devaluating a business because of the lack of marketability, because of partners and things that are incredibly complicated that just kind of dent the surface and don't really provide a really big impact. And again, that's my definition of, hey, or my example of pound of cure versus ounce of prevention and how the ounce of prevention early on with the DST can make perhaps one of the most significant differences in your overall ability to reinvest the gross proceeds of those assets, as well as to grow your overall net worth without having to chop off parts of your assets every time that you have a transaction. Absolutely. And let me cover a couple of things you can do, by the way. Um, it can invest in just anything, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. You can dollar cost average. You can buy insurance. Um, you can buy commercial real estate. It can be passive or active. You can put it back into cryptocurrency. You can start a new business venture. You can do ground up development with the money. It can separate partnerships. So each partner can have their own trust and go their separate way. Uh, it can move funds outside of your taxable estate, which eliminates kind of what Jake is saying there. We literally change the characteristics from ownership to a lender in a way we do that. We get the funds outside the taxable estate. So if you have a hundred million or $200 million deal, at the close of escrow, all of those funds and equity can be outside of your taxable estate and literally eliminate that estate tax, which is incredible. Defer the capital gains tax and, and defer the income tax. As you receive payments, you'll pay tax, and that's how you pay tax on this, by the way, as you receive them. And most of our clients are setting these structures up in increments of 10 years, and every 10 years they can renew for 10 years, okay? And, every, and, and, and typically they're just taking interest-only payments where they get a 1099 INT, and they pay ordinary income tax on that. Now, if they move out of a state that has a higher income tax rate into a lower income tax rate, like a Florida or a Texas or a Tennessee or a Nevada, and they were in, let's say, California or New York or New Jersey, and they establish residency, then their tax will be paid based upon that, uh, that state in which they're in and their income at that point. We also like to say that we basically are just solving a Rubik's cubes for people every single day with tax flow and cash flow and investments. And this dream team is our goal to become a part of your dream team and earn that right. 
uh, to, to have Jake Miller as a financial advisor. My role as a trustee, I'm also a commercial real estate expert. And then the tax attorney and CPA is the legal and CPA expert. And this dream team is going to help you with this deferred sales trust, defer the tax and grow your wealth, right? It's not just a passive type of thing. It can be active or passive. It's kind of like a Swiss army knife, right? And that's a really cool thing. It can do a lot of things and it can be really just passive and simple retirement. It can also be for the active entrepreneur. And so those are just some of the the major the major mechanics of the trust. Jake, any thoughts on that? You know, it, it's important that this structure is there because it has to be a third party transaction. Literally, we want the IRS, if they should ever pick you out of one of 2000 people, what have you, right? Um, we want them to look at Brett, not at the client. Because technically Brett is the, as the trustee, he's taken responsibility for management of the assets internally. And he may delegate some of that management to myself, so to speak, or another financial advisor, somebody that can handle some of the liquid assets inside of the trust, while there may be outside of marketable securities, any number of other types of investable assets. It could be private stock, ownership in somebody's company. Um, it could be warrants for a future stock that might be issued. It could be place, I mean, it can just be any number of, of items that would otherwise show up on your balance sheet. And that's... It's important to understand the role that everybody plays. Uh, the law firm, they provide lifetime audit protection and legal representation for the trust and its transactions. And so they're critical in the very beginning. And anytime there's additional purchases, additional purchases or additional um, involvement that the trust has in other transactions. And that's a critical point as well. And then of course, my job is just kind of like in the interim, what do we do with the cash meanwhile so that we're not losing to inflation and that we are maintaining our ability to purchase those assets in a timely manner when they become available, when the market for whatever that next asset is, is right. Absolutely. Way, I, I was going to say that, Brett, I, I love your flow chart. I think this has been incredibly helpful recently for a lot of clients. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you're going over it today. Yeah. And, and these are some of the things just to kind of give you guys one take a picture of this. And by the way, um, we, we have a uh, YouTube channel. If you're not checking us on YouTube, we have lots of, of, of individual uh, breakdowns of 1031 exchange versus the deferred sales trust, a Delaware statutory trust versus versus the deferred sales trust. Uh, you know, how do we know it's legal? Um, you know, what can you invest in? Uh, uh, wh where, where and how can I invest the funds? But a couple of things that we've already touched on some of this, right? You can buy back in and out of real estate, all tax deferred at any timing. All, there's no timing restrictions, right? You just can't buy back into a primary home that's taxable I mean, you can always take payments from the trust and just and just use that for a down payment or, or buy, buy a property and just pay tax on that but if it's going to be an investment property you can defer it um, but also you you get a chance to to delay some of that income tax right so this is powerful way we call it the tax flow strategy of net in, net rental income where if you buy a property through the DST you don't have to take the rental income and said the income can be put back into the DST and invest into stocks bonds and mutual funds and this can lower your tax bracket potentially and you can earn interest on the income you would have normally paid to Uncle Sam. So think of it kind of like an IRA, but doing that with the trust tax deferred um, in real estate property, or, or even just, you can just, just put it right into stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and the same thing, it can grow, the interest can grow until you start receiving the income. Now, you can't delay it forever. You do need to start receiving income, typically within the first two years, but it doesn't have to be the full interest payment. Um, what is the interest payment? The interest payment is typically somewhere right around eight, uh, five to eight percent, depending on your risk tolerance, net of the recurring fees. That's the goal, not a promise, not a guarantee. We got to go earn that over any 10 year period of time, but you don't necessarily have to take all of that eight percent interest. In fact, most of our clients are taking somewhere between five and six percent interest, and they're taking it starting in maybe year one or two and then they're delaying and deferring the rest and letting it grow, okay, in investments, um, which leads into part number three that could be really interesting to you. And this is partnership interest, right? So part of the challenge of the 1031 exchange is the whole entity must remain together, whereas with the deferred sales trust, not the case. In fact, we just did a deal in San Diego, $13 million car wash sale. They bought it for about 4 million, or actually built it for 4 million, and then sold it for 13 and they had four partners and they wanted to go their separate way, but they didn't want to do 1031 exchanges. Part of why is because 
They want to go buy land for $500,000 and put a $3.5 million property on there, build a business and sell it over again. They don't want to buy something for 13 million. That doesn't make any sense. They want to add value and grow. And so they, three of the four actually decided to use the deferred sales trust. The fourth one just paid their tax. So it can separate the partner's interest. It can separate their equity into their OT each individual trust and they can also partner in the, in the future too if they want to and the one that's i think super super amazing is it's a 1031 exchange alternative or rescue right so if you ever get that feeling in your gut you're like oh my gosh i'm about to have to overpay for a property you never have to feel that again in fact um we've saved numerous 1031 exchanges this year alone um it can also be an all, a, a, a partial 1031 exchange or a partial Delaware. Sometimes the deferred sales trust hasn't solved every problem like mortgage over basis. And we might need to use what's called a Delaware statutory trust, or I like to call it a Delaware 1031. And as a partial amount of, of the equity that's trading, the other amount will be the deferred sales trust to give you all the entrepreneurial freedom and liquidity and diversification, right? But we can save a failing or failing 1031 exchange. Here's the key. You want to make sure you get with us to work with qualified intermediaries that are your friend or are friendly to the deferred sales trust. Know how to work with us and how to execute on this and not a group that doesn't know about it or they know about it and they don't want you to know about it and they will not cooperate. And that's where I would, it's kind of going to the big bank you, know, you go to like a big Wells Fargo and they just say no to everything. You're like, well, why am I doing business with you? I might as well go to like a local credit union or someone who's more flexible and then you can do stuff. Well, that's like the qualified intermediaries that we work with. They're very entrepreneurial. They're very client focused on being able to offer all Delaware statutory trust, 1031 exchanges, and the deferred sales trust. Okay, moving on. We already talked about liquidity and diversification. That's so important, but you can convert highly appreciated single assets with all of your equity into a diversified portfolio of liquid investments that are investment grade, right? Um, and, and that are biggest companies in the world, right? And Netflix, Costco, Google, you know, Apple, where, where it's very, very safe. You can be protected and hedged against a market. Even if it crashes, Jay can work with you on that. And then we can get back into uh, real estate, back to number one, right? Which is buy back into real estate at a low point. That's where a lot of my clients like to do. So um, number seven, depreciation. This is pretty cool. You can actually get a new depreciation schedule if you actively purchase a, a, an investment with the trust. Now you only get up to 80% of that, but that's pretty neat because if you own a multifamily property for 27 and a half years, you lose that depreciation, which offsets the cash flow. So what do you want to do? Well, you don't want to 1031 that because if you were to do that, you have an old depreciation schedule. Not great. But what if you could buy that same property, maybe even buy it in a couple of years when the price is lower, and yet get a brand new depreciation schedule? Well, the answer is you can now with the Deferred Sales Trust. And so those are the seven major benefits of the Deferred Sales Trust. Jake, any thoughts on any of that? No, I think that that last one is actually very helpful for a lot of people that we've been talking to recently in the sense that with the depreciation schedule, I mean, should we just do the 1031? Or on the piece that we do the partial 1031, if we need to for whatever purpose, there's, there's not that additional tax benefit that a lot of people have when they buy a new piece of real estate. Um, but with the deferred sales trust, as we're rolling assets over, liquidating them, buying them again, there is that benefit. And we talk a lot about taxes, tax deferral, what things are now. But you, you say all the time, Brett, it's not just cash flow, it's tax flow. It's what's available for people and, and what they're able to participate with in the next deal. And, you know, the whole reason for this, this isn't, you know, a lot of times maybe, Brett, we should talk about who this is not for. Some of our clients that maybe come and look at this or they're kicking the tires. And when is it that we tell them no? Because I think that's helpful uh, for, for a few scenarios here that might clarify and add more substance to what you just presented. Yeah, we would say no. Um, by the way, we're going to open up for questions here in just, just 30 seconds. Um, so you can type your question in the chat. And I do see there's a couple questions in the chat that we will be answering. And you can also unmute yourself and just say your first name and your city that you're, you're in. And we can start to dissect your deal live right now if you'd like to share that or answer just questions for a friend. You know, it could be for a friend that you're asking if you want to be, be kind <laughs> of a, a confidential, which is cool too. So, um, yeah, we say no when someone wants to just go spend the money on all their stuff, right? Personal stuff. And that's cool. It's your money to do it. It's because it's taxable. Well, we can't help you there, right? We say no if the if the if the equity to the 
the uh, the net proceeds or equity um, and the tax liability are out of ratio. What, what do I mean by that? Like, let's say you had a hundred million dollar sale and only like a hundred a million dollars of tax, right? Well, that's not great. Just you don't need our 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 services to manage a hundred million dollars when you only have a million of tax, just pay your tax and go do what you want with your money. Now, if you have a hundred million dollar sale and 30 or 25 or 30 or 40 million dollars of tax, well, that's a no brainer, right? Let's, 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 you could pay a huge percentage or the trust, let me put it like this way. The trust can pay a huge percentage and the government's interest on the money that you owe it and your money combined, hopefully we out earn the, uh, the, the, the fees, right? And, and, you know, past performance on a prediction of future results, but over any 10 year period of time, we've been be able to do pretty well. Um, but uh, that's, that's really the math there. So we wanna make sure the ratios make sense. We wanna make sure that your vision makes sense for your wealth. Um, one of the questions, by the way, that we do have is uh, from Andrew, he says, you know, what, what happens, uh, you know, with the, let me actually read it. Let me pull it up. I read it a minute ago. Uh, when, it, when it was deferrable, is it taxable in the future? Yes, if and when you receive it, uh, Andrew, right? And now most people do not receive the principal. They just live off the interest and you'll always pay tax on the interest payments, right? So we call, we call it the golden goose laying the golden egg. The golden goose is, let's say you had a $3 million exit and those are the 3 million that goes into the trust and you would have paid a million of tax on that 3 million. Well, the golden goose is that 3 million. Most will just live off the interest payments. They'll pay ordinary income tax on that, but they won't pay They'll keep the deferral going on the three. Same way a 1031 exchange works, by the way. Um, also, what if my what if what if my daughter um, can she inherit it without paying tax? Well, so it's not without paying tax. I think what you're referring to is a stepped up basis. Um, the stepped up basis is not um, with the deferred sales trust. Uh, however, your daughter can step into your shoes and she can continue the tax deferral on the principal amount right, the golden goose, and the golden egg she'd pay ordinary income tax on. And so remember, you're changing your ownership hat to a lender, and that's really the key here. That's why, That's why. by the way, you also can't have outside your taxable estate and a stepped up basis. You can have one or the other, but you can't have both. So if, if you're ultra high net worth listening to this, it's not even about capital gains tax really anymore. It's really about your estate tax. If they're gonna take, if they're gonna take it, the mousetrap of the government, the way it's set up is going to, Inherit 40% of your wealth above 22 million married, 12 million single. Those exemptions are set to cut in half, probably likely in 2025. So hopefully that answers your question, Andrew, but I'm gonna ask you right now, you wanna unmute yourself. Um, you wanna ask any additional questions on so that particular what part. About, yeah, what about if she, if she wants to touch the money in the future and she above the bracket 12 million at the moment? So she wants to, she, 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 so you pass away and she inherit the, the trust is passed. Um, uh, the promise note is passed and she starts receiving payments and you say her, her, her income was a million at the point. What, is that what you said? No, if she above the bracket 12 million, I know, I know about that, but if she already above that and, uh, what is the way for her to touch the money? If I'm selling, for example, um, the home right now. So the, Payment stream would go back to you first, right? And and if you wanted to give money to your daughter, you would first pay tax on that, and then it would go to your daughter. You know, you can do whatever you want. So in other words, you can't sell it, defer it, and have the payments while you're still alive go to your daughter, right? So um, these trusts are set up as single entity business trusts that only do business with you, and if you're married, your spouse. And and so the the step one is the payments go to you and your spouse. Step two, if one of you pass away, it just goes to that other spouse. Step three, if you set up inside of your living trust, you add the promissory note to that, then upon both of you passing, they could step into your shoes and then start receiving the payments. Does that answer the question? Yeah, personally, kind of personally. So but ask yeah. it again, because I want to make sure I got it. Keep going. Well, so, um, well, is there the way to put money on my daughter so she not she not paying tax at all, and now I'm not going to be taxed as well. So pause. If let's you, back up. What what are you selling? What give me give me some of those details. So, uh, home for example. Okay, what's it worth? Uh, right now one of them three and a quarter. Okay, three and a quarter. What do you owe? On that full cash. Okay, you owe it all cash. Great. And what did you buy it for? Uh, two million. Okay. Is it a primary or a rental? It's a uh, one of the secondary. It's a 
it's, it's well, not even yeah. mental. It's, it's, yeah, it's uh, it was there, and I'm just need to get rid of it. Okay, so it, you never rented it out before. You just, it, you, but you, it's not your primary anymore. Yeah. Okay, got it. So, uh, did you put any major improvements into it after you bought it for two million? Like hundred thousand. Okay, so we're gonna take basically three and a quarter minus two point one million, right? And that's gonna give us our gain. What state is the property located in? California, Carlsbad. All right, so three, two, five, and uh, we've got uh, 2.1, all right, 1150. Jake, I think this is gonna be a 37% Obamacare, but I'm not certain because it's kind of in the middle, but we're just gonna assume that, and maybe you check that out, Andrew. 37% is gonna be $425,000 of tax, okay? Um, so how a yeah i mean we can we can we can you could sell you can move all of the money into the trust you can defer the 425 of tax the payments can start coming back to you right away you got to pay tax on whatever you receive so this isn't tax avoidance or tax elimination on on the capital gains tax or the income tax um so there's no now there are ways to sh to, to shelter some of that if you were to partner with the trust and purchase investment real estate like a multifamily project which you could do some cost segregation on and probably wash out income versus depreciation in a given year so there are ways to get there it just would take you guys buying a property is that making sense andrew yeah when you're saying the multifamily is it supposed to be multifamily or i can go with the pro one property one family you can five, do one family. You can do single family rentals. It just can't be a primary home rental, but it can be duplex, triplex. It can be ground up development. As long as it's investment or in business purpose, it's not your primary. Okay, got it. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. By the way, people might be wondering what would be the way to structure this deal. Jake, any thoughts on the way to maybe borrow up into the basis and then reverse reverse back out of it so Andrew would have a better deal? What do you think? Absolutely. No, I think that would be the most recommended thing to do is that way give him a greater amount of liquidity. You want to explain that so people know what, what we're talking about here? Because they might have missed it. Yeah, so if this is his personal home, borrow up until the it's basis. It's not a personal. It's it, it's, it's a side home, but but his basis is $2 million, even if it was a rental, right? It's $2 million, 2.1. So in, the, in this scenario, you could try to get the liquidity out, borrow up to what you have in, in basis there. So get your, your $2 million, your $2 million, whatever out of it that right? And then uh, you can do a number of different things at that point with the sale of a home. We can do a deferred sales trust for part of it. It should you not take all the cash out and everything else. We can do a Delaware Cessure Trust Fund 1031 eligible rollover, but then you lose liquidity. So it's almost like, why did we go this direction if liquidity was what we were looking for? But at the end of the day, there's, there's a handful of options there for you. And uh, getting kind of up to your basis out of it before the transaction could be rather advantageous because then you've got that in hand, so to speak. Yeah. And so Angel, just encapsulate that for everybody too. You have the ability, since you own it free and clear of $3.25 million. And again, check with your CPA on your adjusted basis, but let's say, assume it's 2.1. That basically means you could do a cash out refi of 2.1 million now, and that's, that's tax free. And then upon sale, you pay off that debt right away. So you do like a short-term loan and that can roll into the trust to defer that 425. And it's kind of the best of both worlds. We just saved you on basically 2.1 million of paying us, right? Which we don't mind doing that if it, if you if your tax liability uh, was higher, like right? if it was basically another four, to, to 600,000, because that, may, that would mean your basis is lower, right? So in other words, take advantage, especially if you're still credit worthy, right? Right, uh, borrowing up to your basis, especially if you're gonna be selling the property. Then we do the deferred sales trust to defer the remainder. So the, the basically the 1.15 would go into the trust and, uh, and that means you only have to pay fees on 1.15. Did you see that, Andrew? Is that making sense? Any questions there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because originally I was uh, was thinking before just ten thirty, uh, ten thirty one. But um, well, I had sold another property for two million, and uh, what's come up? I want to buy something for five, but I want to do the ten thirty one re re kind of with the with the buyback, so I can put in my three million up front. So it's kind of risky. So uh, I was kind of looking for something. 
Yeah, and by the way, if you find the deal that makes sense, we'll give you a high five on the 1031, man. You found the needle in the haystack. I, mean, I just sold a deal up here for 3.3 cap for a client. It's 48 units, 7.7 .7 million. The, they're borrowing at a four and a half. Now, they, of course, they can raise the rents, and that's great. If you find a deal, like go for it. By the way, we work on a conditional basis, so we don't you don't pay us anything unless unless you actually use the trust. And for mm -hmm. any reason, if you decide to do a 1031 on an investment property or decide the buyer doesn't perform, you don't owe us anything. But the point of all that is um, clarify that the deal makes sense. If it makes sense, 1031 is simple. Cost you a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks, easy, you know, all day long. But most people aren't finding deals that make any sense right now, right? And it's even even they're very cautious because interest rates are going up and there's this uncertainty of, whoa, what's going to happen in the next 3, 6, 12 months? And this is why the deferred <laughs> sales trust is perfect because you can sell high, defer the tax, get on the sidelines, pay off your debt if you had any debt, and just be patient with your powder being dry. You can literally just sit in the bank and just wait and just be like, hmm, when are these deals going to come up? Because I can promise you in the next 12 to 24 months, there will be investment real estate foreclosures for people who overpaid, took on too much debt, and and probably did a 1031 into the property, and they cash flow made zero sense. Is that, is that resonating with you, Andrew, or what do you think about that? Um, so I don't have any debt, but I'm just looking for the best way to invest and hold the equity to build that without um, not touching, not paying, and def uh, not even defer, but transfer that in the future. Yeah, well, the, the first sales trust seems like a perfect fit for you so far. So get offline and, and book book us, Jake and I, and we're happy to go through it in more detail. Appreciate you participating today. I want to open it back up for anybody else that has questions. You can unmute yourself and just say hello, first name, and where you're from, and what questions you have. It could be questions, could be comment, could be anything that you'd like to just just uh, just to uh, add to the conversation. It's like Marty had a question here. Marty, you you still there? And so Micah had a question too. Michael or Marty there, you want to ask your question? If not, I can just read it, but okay. Sure, I'll ask a question. Oh, thank you. Um, so I wanted to find out where the, um, the interest rate comes from and how that's determined. When they can take interest only and they don't have to take all the interest, but how is that determined? It's a great question. Jake, you want to take that one? I've been talking a lot. So essentially, an interest rate needs to be something that's considered marketably um, marketable. meaning if you're going to get a personal loan from a bank out there wherever that we're in the same range so to speak and there are loans that are more favorable loans that are more aggressive but within a range of what we like to say right now and things are changing a little bit as we can see but we've said from four to like eight percent right now it's kind of looking more like five simply just because hey jake you're kind of breaking up i think your signal's a little bit to not Mexico ever appear hey jake Hey, Jake, your Me Mexico City, I think Mexico City's internet is down a little bit. So I'm going to jump in there because it's a little bit choppy. So uh, step one, the, the actual client will fill out what's called a risk tolerance questionnaire. And if they're married, them and their spouse will fill that out. And that helps to score risk. Now, once that score is risked, uh, risk is scored, risk is scored, uh, then a interest rate can be, uh, we try to mirror that, right? Where we could say, okay, based upon your risk tolerance, we need to invest in these investments and these investments will return about this percentage. And that can range from about five to eight um, percent, generally speaking, okay? And net of the fees to Jake and myself on the recurring basis. And so uh, step one, fill out a risk tolerance questionnaire. Step two, an interest rate is assigned. And um, that's really the answer to the questions. Now, the is that, is that sound good, Micah? How's that sound? Um, not exactly. I, mm. I, I'm talking about like when they receive payments and they receive, mm. didn't you say that they received a portion or you receive a percentage of the interest when you receive? Yes. Okay, years? good question. So let's uh, talk about the, pay, the, the payment back and what interest they can receive back. Okay. So they can receive principal and interest. It could, they could... They can receive um, interest only, and they could just choose that. I mean, what, how really the good way to ask it is, what do you want, what do you need, and what's very tax efficient for you based upon your, your goals and your wants, right? And it's, it's, we always say, hey, it's your money, well, what do you want? And they go, well, I wanna start with 10,000 a month or 15,000 a month or 100,000 a month, depending on the size of the deal. They can dip into principal, dip into interest, and it, it, could, be, it could be whatever they want. Now, 
most people are typically stating, well, I don't necessarily want to pay, eat up the golden goose that lays the golden egg. So most are taking a five to six percent payout, starting somewhere within a year or two. Um, and and uh, but that doesn't affect the promissory note. That's a, that's a set rate based upon the risk tolerance. But the payment can be adjusted. By the way, you might start out um, saying. I need money right away, month one, right? Right away, and this is the amount. Um, and we always say, take what you want. Just realize whatever you take, you can't put back into the trust. It's, it's gonna be taxed. Does that sound, answer the question, Michael? Yep, that's it, thanks. Okay, cool. Good question. Marty, how about you, Marty? You got a question? If Marty's still here. And if Marty's not here, he did have a good question. And I will um, pull it up. First of all, he asked about the recordings. Yes, this is being recorded. This is live streamed every Friday. 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. And uh, we have a couple other channels as well, like Twitter and Facebook and different things like that. So you can uh, check that out there. But Marty had a second question too. It says, please explain how the transfer of the assets into the DST mitigate the estate tax. Yeah, so Marty, that's that's a um, that's an NDA kind of higher higher level answer. Um, the outcome is 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 that, but that would be something that we would have to um, have a have a live deal off offline that we we uh, we don't disclose. That's that's not it's it's, it's a DST 2.0 or a DST plus. So get with us offline on that. Anyone else have any questions or thoughts, comments? You can unmute yourself now and say hello. You got here. See the gallery. I'm gonna start pulling up people. We got Rebecca. We got Brennan. We got Shane. We got Alejandra. I can I, I butchered that. Alejandra Rodriguez. We got Maria. We got Timothy. Anybody else? Even Andrew. Andrew can come back in. We got a few minutes. If Andrew has more, if not, just give a thumbs up that you're good. Okay, he's good. All right, Jake. Anything else? I mean, where, if people want to get in touch with you, Jake, right now. Where can they find you? Yeah, so we have a new website. It's strategictaxsolutions.com, strategictaxsolutions.com. We also have an 800 number that they can call. Carly at the uh, receptionist, she can um, coordinate something with us, and that's at 1-800-773-1848. Amazing, and I want to thank everyone for listening to another mastermind or attending or participating um, in the Capital Gains Tax Solution Deferred Sales Trust Mastermind. If we can be of service to you to clarify your exit plan, connect you with an amazing broker to help you sell the asset, um, to, to strategize how to invest the assets, and obviously to execute and be the Deferred Sales Trust trustee with you day to day, hour to hour, to execute this an ongoing um, service for you. We would love the opportunity to serve you. You can go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. That's capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. By the way, look for the new book that's coming out. This is called The Building a Tax Deferred Exit Strategy. Uh, it's coming out soon. We have the Jake Muller you just heard from in the book. We have people like Kevin Heron from Shark Tank, and I got a few chapters in there as well. We'd love for you to pick that up on Amazon. Uh, coming out here shortly. Go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com and then look for the book drop in about 30 days. Appreciate everyone out there. Please rate, review, subscribe. Please share this with somebody that can inspire and literally change their life because they're not having to pay tax right away. They're able to defer it and or eliminate the estate tax. We appreciate everyone out there. Talk to you again real soon. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.